How's it going, Michael? It's good. Good to be good to be back. Good to be live again. Wow, a lot of news this week. One big story. It is. What are we going to talk one about? Big, one big story. It's like a hundred big stories. And like I think I was telling you, like I, I cannot get that Beatles song out of my out of my head. What's it called? A day in the life. A day in the life. I heard the news today. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> I think it's oh boy. Exactly. Um. So but, we normally end our. And I'm just going to go right at this. Yeah, we normally end our podcast with something that I like to call "That's a big surprise," and it's normally a sarcastic look at something that's happened in the news. It's generally a funding or a shutdown or just something that was just so obvious that was either going to happen or get reported at some point in time mm. that it requires a little bit of sarcasm. And while I don't want to make light of anything that's happened in the past week, whether it's the guys at Binary Capital or Chris Saka, who is has been a phenomenal investor with a great track record over time, um, you know, from Napster to Facebook to everything, really, and one of the biggest external shareholders in Twitter, um, you know, and all the way to Dave McClure. I don't think any of the stuff that's been going on in the news, particularly the Dave stuff, is um, is too big a surprise. But let's kind of just dive in on this, okay? Let's do it. Um, Where do you yeah, start with I mean, this? Well, I think you start because I think you start with binary capital, and I know that's not going to be really obvious to most people, but I think you start with binary. And one of the co-founders, this guy Justin Caldbeck, and I just want to read, you know, from something that was in TechCrunch a few days ago. What's the date on this thing anyway? June thirtieth, so only three or four days ago, right? So Justin called Justin Callback resigns, um, and Matt Mazio, who God, I could not feel worse for Matt Mazio because Matt comes from Lightspeed Ventures. This was Chris Zaka's kind of private venture capital fund. And Matt was the guy, according to Chris, not according to me, but Matt was the guy who really did all the legwork. Um, you know, Chris did the final approval, but it was a small firm. It was run really lean and it was really just the two of them trying to figure out into what types of things they should invest. And they did a pretty good job at it as well. Anyway, this guy at Binary Capital, Justin Caldbeck, he's, you know, they were revelations that came out last week had said that he had examples have shown that he had, um, you know, basically sexually harassed a ton of women over the years. Like, I love this, has harassed or preyed upon numerous female founders who'd met with callback in a professional capacity wow. over the years. Now, it's not just like last week. It's not the week before that. It's over the years. And that just must mean who knows how many people, right? And, uh, you know, when we were thinking about what we should talk about tonight, I really said to you, I don't think we can let this week pass without running by this, particularly because a few weeks ago, I mean, let's get the exact timing on this, right? But a few weeks ago, we did, you know, ATP 22 yep. and ATP 23. And I told you, I went to this breakfast in the morning and, and we did two episodes, right? Featuring female entrepreneurs from the Bangkok Breakfast Network. And then the second one, fe Female Entrepreneurs in Asia Part 2, yep. we talked by about at least eight women that I found, not, not just you know, not just amazing, but really inspirational. And part of the reason why was because just the headwinds, first of all, the headwinds against entrepreneurs are just so strong to begin with. Most people fail. Um, but at least most men have a fighting chance. And most women don't. It gets so hard really in any industry, but we're talking about tech. I mean, we could back up if you wanted to and say, how about finance? I mean, I think you could walk up and down Wall Street and find it littered with people who would complain about sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and sort of the predatory tales of men. And I, I think really one of the phrases that came to my mind was that with great, with, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm. Okay. And we'll get to, we'll get to f the 500 startups thing. Um, and at least there was some type of contrition there, although to be fair, you know, I, I don't think you can really punch somebody in the face for like 10 years running and then be contrite. Mm. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, I, cannot, yeah. I can't just drop a chair on your head every day in silence. And then when somebody then, then when somebody finds out about it, it says, oh, gosh, that was really bad behavior. I really shouldn't have done that. And I really appreciate everybody kind of jumping in and telling me that I shouldn't have done that in the first place. Who's punching who in the head here? Well, I mean, the guy, who, the guy who's being predatory and who's, mm. you know, sexually harassing and sexually abusing women. Because, you know, here's the thing, too. See, integrity is the thing that you do when no one's looking. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and, and I've been thinking about this for a really long time. That's not a phrase that just kind of popped into my head. This is an outgrowth of years and years of thought on this topic. And, you know, it's like, what do you do when no one's paying attention? I'll give you the perfect example. And I hate to even use myself as an example, but like, 
Last night, I went to a parking lot for my motorcycle, right, for my scooter. It was 40 baht. All I had was 25 baht on me. That's it, in cash. That's it, all I had. It was raining outside. It was late. And I said to the guy, look, I'll come back tomorrow with 15 baht. The only problem is I don't speak that much Thai, and he didn't speak any English. Okay? I went back today, and I gave whoever was sitting in that chair 15 baht. And the guy was like, no, 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 you don't have to pay. I'm like, no, no, this is for yesterday. Hmm. And no one knows and no one cares. And 15 baht, frankly, is 45 cents. But like that's the rule. Like there's certain right. acceptable behavior. Anyway, let's go let's go back and talk about this. So this starts in my mind with binary. Okay, because this is really the beginning of it. And if you look at so Justin was a poor behavior a poor behavior, right? And then it turns out that his partner was not above the fray either. And I forget his first name, but Mr. Tio resigned as well. And now the two basically general partners for this fund are gone. Now it's interesting, right? Because the limited partners look around and say, Oh my god. What are we going to do and how are we going to manage this fund? But deeper than that, deeper than that, the investee companies say, if you just put another man in charge or somebody out of this organization in charge of that, we want to buy back all of our stock. Mm. At whatever you think the fair market value is or whatever the last price was it traded, we want to buy back our stock because we don't want to have any association with you. This is a powerful thing. You don't, there, you don't really see this so much. Um, secondary purchases of existing stock by the founders, right, or by the company itself, really just saying, I want to disassociate myself with you. And this is really all just because of sort of predatory behavior by, by the two, um, the two co-founders of this firm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they did get emails from some of the companies in which they invested. And, and this company actually invested in some great companies like Snapchat, Twitter, like these guys were not investment idiots and they had just raised a hundred and another hundred and seventy five million dollar fund not all of which or not the majority of which apparently had been deployed but here's what happens right and i was talking to somebody else about this today yeah some of this is going to come out sounding wrong right because it's not a fully thought out it's not a fully um, formed thought if you're a man talking to another man and that man does something aggressive at its core right you just punch him back mm. And that's like acceptable behavior in society. It's not, it may be right or wrong. We can argue about that forever. But you've learned that in the playground, in the yard, right, as a kid. You sure have. Your dad tells you that. Again, whether it's right or wrong, I'm not, I'm yeah. not making a value judgment as usual. I'm just pointing out what we know. And what we know is if two men are sitting next to each other and one of them swears at you or pushes you or hits you with something, you just punch them back. And actually, there's no shame in going like this. Really? I'll be right back. Yeah. And you get two of your friends from Brooklyn. <laughs> and then you beat this guy. Look, like, these things happen and no one feels the worst for the wear except the guy who started the fight. Yeah. And all this is, you know, you can make a claim as to whether it's acceptable behavior or not, but it's behavior that society accepts at some level. Okay, but let's take this and turn it around a little bit. If a man does the same thing to a woman, okay, some type of predatory behavior, some sort of harassment or some sort of abuse – what is that woman's choice? Mm. Particularly if there's business on the line, right? And again, her, her outlets for these business are limited to begin with, right? And part of it is because of this sort of predatory and sort of sexual energy that ends up being in the room when those types of conversations are taking place. And we'll get later to Cheryl Yeo, right? The woman who built a company in Silicon Valley, sold it to Walmart, a really impressive lady, um, from Malaysia, came back to Malaysia to run one of the most famous incubators, not just in Malaysia, but in Southeast Asia called Magic. Um, and they were do she was doing deals together with 500 startups through Dave McClure. And she wrote a very long blog post about yeah, yeah. a whole bunch of experiences, which I'm, I'm sure you've read. Stinging. Stinging, very stinging. Anyway, the point is that that woman has no outlet and no recourse. Mm. None. Because if she, think about it, let's use the same example. She goes to her friends and says, that guy did this to me. In most cases, those women are going to go like this. Oh, shit. Okay. Look, don't say anything. Yeah. What a jerk. We'll get past yeah. this. He's an idiot. He's a jerk. We know that. We knew that going in. Um, this behavior is not completely unexpected, right? But look, let's just soldier on. You'll get what you need, and then you'll just move on, and you'll forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Suck it up. Just suck it up. But we know, like we know. So, so here's, this is what's been going on. And this is what happened to Callback. And clearly this is what happened to Dave McClure as well. 
And I think Chris Zucker came out before the New York Times actually printed a full-fledged story about him. And, you know, his apology was more like he'd taken it off of stock photo. Oh, wow. Right? And that's okay, right? I mean, at least at some level, the guy came clean. And at least at some level, McClure came clean. But we can talk about why this is really important and why this type of behavior is just completely unacceptable. Look, like I said earlier, sometimes saying you're sorry it just isn't enough. Hmm. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a couple of equivalencies here, right? Let's 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 talk a little bit about this. Anyway, so the binary guys they basically shut themselves down, okay? And then as soon as that happens, right now it's the doors open a little bit, and now some women are feel a little bit more comfortable coming out and saying, okay, should I talk about this? Hmm. Maybe I'm still a little bit afraid because just because that happened doesn't mean it's okay for me to come out. These are still extremely powerful men. I would guess, although I don't have the stats in front of me, right, that something over 95% of the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are male. Yeah. Now, you know, now women have been laid to this game, and we can argue again about what the hiring policies are like and who's really qualified to do this. But regardless, let's get back to this thing. You know, great, with great power comes great responsibility. Just because you're in power doesn't mean you kind of get to do whatever you want to do, right? And particularly, the more power you have, the more responsible you have to be because your actions have more influence. The implications of your actions are much more influential. It's very, very important, right? So now these women, these other women started coming out, and the New York Times like published a really long story about how the tech industry has suffered a, a huge gender imbalance, which we know about. And that when called back and the binary capital guys came out and, you know, basically admitted that, that they'd done stuff wrong, now you start having this sort of decency thing come out in Silicon Valley where we have to sign decency pledges and everybody sort of has to start paying attention. In the background, you know, at 500 startups, McClure and Christine Tsai and all the people that are associated with that firm are going, oh, no. You just know it. I mean, I can't be convinced. We kind of operate under the under the assumption that everybody knows. It's like an open secret. Mm. Yeah. And for those of us who, who have worked at corporations with more than four people in them, you know, you always knew what was going on, you, but you also knew what you could and could not discuss. Mm. And I kind of want to move on from that to, to Dave's apology, right? Because I think this is where things start getting going really wrong now, i don't know like do you have an opinion on on this stuff as, as well or right yeah no but we'll, we'll get into it. i mean the apology was interesting i think we'll talk a bit about that but that whole thing i'm a creep i'm sorry yeah i mean apologies go some way but they don't admonish you they don't make it good they can help with helping people understand why things happened right but it doesn't make what happened any better no I, and it was quite, it's quite a heartfelt apology from Dave McClure, but as I said, it doesn't make what he did any better. So it's kind of interesting to see what he... I mean, he was trying some damage limitation. He knew he was screwed. I mean, he wanted to get well, out completely. there before, before he, Co his, he was going to get his ass roasted by the media. Right? <laughs> well, completely. Look, his biggest... Not his biggest problem, but you know, one of the things that he's created for himself is that he's been a media... Yeah. What's the right word? I don't want to use the word that I normally use in private, but look, he's been basically a media whore for a long time. That's been his way. He thinks like the more publicity that I can get, the better off I'll be. And in some cases that works, but in other cases it doesn't. And sometimes if you spend your life having the, like shining the light on yourself, yeah. at some point it's going to be shining when you'd rather be in the dark. And I think what's happened here is, here's the thing I don't understand too. Okay. First of all, Dave, I was born in 1965. I'll be, I was turned 52 years old yesterday, right? Happy Dave was birthday. born in 19... Thank you very little. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, no, but, 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 you know, if Dave were 25 years old or, or maybe even 35 years old, I hate to even say this, but, like, it's, maybe it's a little bit of like, oh, okay, just a little boy. Right. He's just kind of learning. Maybe. Right. But maybe. Yeah. But maybe. It's a maybe, right? But this is a 51-year-old man, and I'm yeah. telling you, you cannot tell me that you just didn't understand whether you're in the tech industry, in the finance industry, in the movie business, like whatever. And look, you know, because you've seen The Godfather, which came out in the 70s. It was about the 50s and the 40s in the United States. Like this type of behavior has been going on forever. The only problem is the internet. Yeah. 
right? And it's fascinating to me that people whose entire lives and entire livings are made by saying connectivity, internet, the network, mm -hmm. you know, viral, all these things, they don't understand that when they send a text to a woman that says something like, you know, I don't know if I should be w thinking about hiring you or hitting on you. Yeah. That it's not going to get out. Yeah, yeah. Just crazy. Okay. And le yeah, and, and let's, be, let's be clear about this. You know, the relationships between men and women are like, they're heavily nuanced constantly, mm. right? And it's not that a single guy or a married guy wants to like date somebody. There's no problem with that at any level. But the point is that proximity is not an excuse for availability. Hmm. Just because somebody is sitting next to you, just because somebody's in your firm, like big companies have policies about this, right? Like you can't date someone that works for you. You can't have a relationship with someone who's on the same team. They do this on purpose because it just ends up being toxic. And as a 51-year-old, you, you know this. Yeah. And, but, and you particularly... Go ahead. But I, I wonder, because, you know, I think about that then. Well, how do these relationships start? You, you know, relationship starts in the workplace. more. That's where you spend 18 hours a day, more or less, right? You know, when you're factoring, commuting and all that. That's, it seems, I think it's, it's kind of strange sometimes, isn't it? It's like, yes, we want to kind of regulate out this bad behavior. But at the same time, it, you know, I think some people pull back a little bit and say, is there a danger of trivializing the other behavior, right? Which kind of like, you know, if you prevent people from getting together, then, you know, you, you kind of like, I don't know, you, you kind of drive the whole thing underground, right? I don't know. I think I always, I mean, when I first saw this story come out, I always wondered whether or not how much truth was behind it. But I did read the whole, you know, there's that expose from the lady you say from Magic. Right. You know, and that, I mean, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I mean, I'm sort of throwing it in because I've, I've read some comments online and I've read some people's opinion pieces and I can get the other side of the coin that people are saying, oh, you know, there's always a risk of trivializing this, right? So I want to understand to what extent this is trivializing, you know, that kind of behavior and what extent it really is a problem, right? Because, you know, it's getting drunk and, you know, making a pass at somebody versus being a sexual predator. I don't know, two of the same thing. No, they're two completely different things, right? But again, it, it, <laughs> there's a time factor and there's a persistency factor as well, right? So I don't, like, if you approach someone and say, I'd like to do this thing, and they say to you, no. Yeah, I'll speak to my husband. Then that's, <laughs> that's a no. Speak to my boyfriend, speak to my lover. I don't care who it is, but that's a no. Like, it's just a no. I'm sorry. And, like... There are so many other options available that if you just focus on the people that say no to you, you're more than just a creep. Right. You are. You just are. And I have this conversation with, with women all the time, frankly, and that is like no, you know, a no is a no, and just move on. Now, frankly, you cannot stop the attraction at some level. So you're right. You can't trivialize it. And, you know, people who work together meet each other, meet up all the time. But in general, you know, pick a number, 80%, 90% of the time you have a man approaching a woman just because that's the way society is structured. Again, I'm not making a value judgment, but that's just the way it works. And if you say, do you want to go out with me? No. But right. that doesn't give you the right to pin somebody up against the wall and start kissing them. It just right. doesn't. I'm sorry. And that's the difference, right? So you can actually go back later and go, hey, look, you know, we just finished working on that project. I'm leaving to go work at this company. I know before we couldn't go out with each other because we work in the same place, but I really liked you. Would, can we have dinner? Th that's an okay thing to do, I think. Right. Because it's not predatory and it's not, you're not forcing yourself on somebody. But right? I guess that's the problem that people have is that they feel that even that could be perceived as predatory by the wrong person. And it's very difficult because it's then hearsay versus hearsay, isn't it? And then that sort of trivializes the, the bigger picture, which is there is a big problem in startups and venture capital, right? For yeah. sure. Right? For sure. But who, who was it who famously said, like, you know, somebody asked another person, like, well, can you please define pornography for me? And the answer was, I can't really give you a definition, but I know it when I see it. Yeah. And I think it's kind of the same thing. I know that's really subtle, but I think it's kind of the same thing. And that is, um, you know, 
I, I can't define exactly for you in every yeah. situation what sexual abuse is or what sexual harassment is. But if I'm sitting in a bar one night in, at Maggie Chew's and I see somebody put their hand on someone's leg without asking, I kind of know what I'm looking at. But is that what it is? I mean, this Dave McClure guy, just for the listeners so they understand, was he just kind of like, you know, made a few passes or was he persistently doing this? Let's just say this. We talked about at the beginning saying um, that's not a big surprise. Right, okay. You know, I don't, I don't have all the statistical data, but I will say this. And I don't like to see anything bad happen to anybody. I really don't. I'm not one of these people that like, and I think most people are like this. I don't think you cheer on the sidelines when someone no. loses their livelihood. I really don't. I don't think anybody likes that. But I think you can make a judgment as to whether it's shocking to you or not shocking. See, something that shocks you is something that you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, oh my God, I won the lottery. I didn't expect that. That's shocking to me, even though I was constantly betting. But when, when the entire like persona around your firm, remember we talked the same thing. We had similar conversations about Travis Kalanick, right? Yeah. We talked about how the macho sort of, I'll knock everybody down to get this thing to work mentality that was, that was pervasive and maybe still be pervasive at Uber. You know, you can't convince me that the people that were at 500, whether they're in San Francisco or in any of the 60 countries where that thing operates, didn't know that this was going on, and that includes the limited. That includes the limited partners, because no limited partner in any business, whether it's in a hedge fund, in a <clears throat> in a venture capital fund, in a private equity fund, has never probably. It's so unlikely that they didn't even go out to dinner with the person with whom they were investing. Okay, now you'll see. I, I just want to go through some of this. I want to unpack it a little bit, right? Mm. You know, I just want to read through from this, right? Where is this thing? You know, I'm ashamed I didn't change my behavior until I was forced to do so by circumstances and others. I, I think this. This is Dave McClure's. This, yeah, this is his. Well, this right. is his. I'm. I'm a creep. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. okay. And frankly, I think. I think when you're writing something like this, you take that. You take the logo of the cat in the hat guy out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just think I just think it trivializes it, you know. And I probably I probably deserve to be called a creep. Like this is supposed to be. It an doesn't obstacle. rhyme anyway. I'm creep. I'm sorry. It needs to rhyme with the cat and the hat logo, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. I've read Green Eggs and Ham. I know the way this whole thing works. You know, my parents read this all this stuff to me when I was a kid. Um, you know, and and remember, this starts way back in what 2000 and something with Sarah yeah. Kunst, who says she, you know, I went there, I applied for a job. And this is where he said, you know, I don't know if I should be hiring you or hitting on you. Right? And again, if you go back and look at some of the SlideShare stuff, and we'll get to SlideShare in a second as well, because the founder of SlideShare came out and said, um, you know, I, I, never had a, I never had a bad thing happen to me. Yeah. And Dave was one of the guys who funded me, even though, even though no, none of the other male sort of venture capitalists that I talked to funded me. Now, she does say in her post – you know, that she's the CEO, but even at the time, like she would go to some of these meetings, some of them, not all of them with her husband at the time. It's pretty hard for someone to hit on you when your husband is there. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, and, and I'll be honest with you. We, I've talked about this in so many other different situations. But I find it really hard to believe that a woman can go through her entire career and see all these other women get harassed and abused and have the sort of predatory behavior occur with them and then come out and say something like, I don't know, nothing bad ever happened to me with this guy. Mm, but that's what she's What's saying, it? right? Rather than what she she's is. actually saw. Yeah, that's okay. But again, like, it's not that everything is like sides, but like, whose side are you on? Yeah. You know this stuff is going on. Again, you know, when I say that's a big surprise, you know, this should be something that's not so shocking. That's the sarcasm part of it, right? And that other woman should just be like, well, you know what? I wouldn't mind if she said, well, nothing bad ever happened to me, but boy, this is not a shocking event, and I think we really need to address this, right? I really need to think we need to sit down, and like, I'm glad the light has been shined on this. And while Dave was really good to me, and I know she says this a little bit, it doesn't excuse any of the other behavior, and frankly... I wish someone had come to me so that I could have helped them because I have, an, he, I have his ear and I can talk to him and things like that. But again, I can't be convinced. You know, I mean, Dave says in here, where is this? 
I just, I just want to get this, and I'm sorry I don't have everything exactly referenced out, but it says, like, first of all, I made advances towards multiple women in work-related situations where it was clearly inappropriate. Mm. I just, I don't even know where to start unpacking that, and that's, like, one of the first sentences in this apology. Mm-hmm. I made advances towards multiple women. How about, like, I was consistently on the prowl and hitting on everything that was moving? <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't just inappropriate. It was just like constant behavior. Look, it, again, if you're in a bar on a Saturday night, like drinking with your friends, and you're not working with somebody, I'm not going to say it's okay, but like, fair enough. Right. But that's what people assume, right? I mean, that's fair game. That's the that's how the game is played out there in the wild, right? So what's the problem with that in the workplace? I know it sounds well, like a silly question, but that's what people no, are asking, right? Yeah, but, the, but and the answer to that is is really straightforward, and that is, if in the in the real world, right, like out in the wild, I have no impact over what happens to you unless I actively like make a decision about your life, where I really have no influence. But in the workplace, particularly if I'm the CEO, hmm. and I'm the tone setter in an office, I mean, I can fire you. Right. I cannot hire you, which is tantamount to firing you for a job that you've never had. So that's the problem. Is, is the point here then, I'm just sort of trying to see it from the other side, is the point here then that because we're in the workplace, that then may make me as a woman feel coerced to do stuff that I don't want to do because I feel Absolutely. that I have to go along with this. Whereas in a bar, it's going to, hey, take a hike, jerk, right? Yeah, take a hike. Yeah, and, and, and believe me, it happens, you know, it's... This happens to men in a bar too, right? Right, yeah. You'll be sitting there. Some dude comes over to you. You don't know who he is. He's the, you know, he's head of the trading desk or whatever. And he's like, hey, man, I'm going to get my beer first. And you're like, I was in line here. And your buddies go, hey, 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 that's Bill. Remember? Yeah, yeah. He's the guy that's in charge of that thing. And you were going to apply for that job. And you're like, oh, okay. That's right. fine. But see, the problem is, in, and I'm, I'm generalizing, right? But like when there's, when there's sex involved, hmm. like all bets are off. It's just not fair. Because... In almost all cases, a man is stronger than a woman, right? On, on the margin, I'm not saying always, right? Sure, there are plenty of women that are ridiculously physically strong. But on the margin, that's not, that's not always the case. And what that means is that, you know, even having the conversation is maybe okay, but that's a maybe. But, you know, we can run through that thing that, that Cheryl wrote, you know, shedding the light, you know, from uh, creepy comments to sexual assault. Like, assault is different. It's the same thing. Here's the thing. If you're in that bar, right, and people actually watch you, you're a guy, you approach another guy, and he's, you know, stepping in front of you at the bar, and that guy punches you, and everybody's seen it in public, right, you can punch that guy back. Mm. And if later you're applying for a job or whatever, and you have, like, a record of that, and people sitting there watching it, like, you've got the physical scar on you of that guy punching you. And there are, there are laws around all this. There are also laws around sexual assault too, right? Mm. But think about it. A woman like Cheryl, who is amazing, has kept this inside, and she's very successful too, doesn't necessarily need anybody's help, but see, other people rely on her. She's an incredible lady, and if you meet her in person, which I have done, and you just listen to her talk, and you, just, you, can, you can sense like the drive and the intelligence – and then you figure out that, like, you know, just because you're in an apartment with somebody doesn't give you – it doesn't mean anything. Mm. It doesn't mean anything. And I can't believe that, you know, okay, if that was four years ago, that makes you 47. If it's five years ago, it makes you 46. It's just not good. It's just not good enough mm. for me, okay? And if it's taken years for somebody who's, like, filled with integrity, like – Cheryl or any of these other I don't know the other women so frankly I can't comment on them but but I've met Cheryl a bunch of times the the whole idea is that she's actually calling this my personal account of sexual assault assault mm. okay she tells a story of you know being in her apartment with a bunch of other people having whiskey poured for her as well right and you can say well she was drunk and whatever not good enough for me never been good enough for me like being drunk is not a good enough reason for someone to go and try to take advantage of you. Just not good enough. And it was Dave, Dave who was filling up the glasses as well. <laughs> Let's not forget well, that. <laughs> but, it, but again, even if, even if that, whether that's true or not, we don't know. We weren't there. That's the way she tells the story. I'm willing to believe it. But even if it's not the case, even if she was filling her own glass, I don't really care. She's allowed to 
drink in her apartment and do whatever she wants. The whole point, though, is that they were working on something really big, right? Okay, that he had tasked her with raising ten million dollars for the fund that Kylie Eng was going to run. Okay, that's the five hundred durians fund that's in Malaysia. Um, she did do that. You know, she said he, he came into Malaysia to meet some of the investors and other people there, um, and that they were working on Cerebro, which was then rebranded as something called Distro Dojo, right? And working on how to make magic like a better and a sort of industry leading incubator. Um, and you know, she when she thinks you know five people or six people or whoever knows are coming back to the apartment for drinking and thinking and talking and you know strategizing. But if the one person like for me. And, and I don't know, I mean, I think for most men, like, you just get uncomfortable when you're sitting alone with someone who's not your girlfriend or whatever. Right. You just leave and excuse yourself. And if they ask you to leave, well, I don't care if you're six sheets to the wind. I think you just get up and leave. Yeah. Sorry, whiskey is not a good enough excuse for me. Yeah. Whatever they, whatever they were drinking. Anyway, you know, and if you go through... And, you know, you read this whole thing that, that Cheryl wrote. I don't know. I didn't do a word count on it, but, boy, it's really long. And I, I guess because this is part – I guess this is part of the thing of being a woman where re- even as she just, l- like, lashes into all this behavior in the end, she still wants to make everything better, hmm. right, which I find really interesting, actually. Okay, this happened. It was really terrible. It was horrible. He's going to take punishment for it. He's partially apologized, right? But I think if you go back and you look at these other women, Sarah Kunst, I think her name is, right? You go back and she's like, apology, apology. I don't really care. This is not good enough for me. Because here's the thing. You can apologize for being let's – go, let's go back to, you know, I'm a creep and I'm sorry, right? For, let's read this. And he's highlighted it, I believe. I don't know if Medium did this for him or if somebody else did it. You know, I'd like to apologize for being clueless. First of all, you're 51 years old. And again, even if you were 41 years old, if you've only been doing this for 10 years, you're not clueless. Mm. Selfish, maybe. Unapologetic, for sure. And defensive, yeah. But, you know, she, he says up here, for people that I have offended, this is not offensive behavior, right? And I think most women would tell you this. They're not offended by it. They're scarred by it, right? It's like the same thing. If you have a small child and every time that child does something wrong, you beat them up as a parent, those children aren't offended by your behavior. Mm. They're scarred by that behavior. And it, frankly, it impacts everything that they do. But even those kids have like an outlet. That's the biggest problem is that Women, these women in tech have been, and I, you know, I, I won't put words in their mouth, but I'll just say kind of what I feel like they're saying is that they've been suffering in silence for a long time. And, and I would spread it out. You know, we talk about tech. That's why we call it the Asia Tech Podcast. But I would say that, you know, this happens to women everywhere. And that's why as soon as, as, soon as um, these, the binary capital thing started happening and as soon as this, this thing with uh, the New York Times started coming out, at some point – there were 12, at least 12 women who came out and said, you know, I had sort of the same experience with Dave. And, you know, he says here, again, I want to, I want to find the line, right? Um, I'm going to get feedback from people. He just says, you know, nobody at the firm knew what I was doing, except like nobody knew. And as soon as they did know, you know, everybody came after me and started saying that, uh, that I should step down. But remember, the first reaction from this internally was, okay, you'll step down as CEO. You don't have any more day-to-day responsibilities, but we're going to keep you on as a general partner, and you're, you'll maintain your fiduciary responsibility. Huh. I think it's important for people to understand what fiduciary responsibility is. That's like the utmost responsibility that a person who invests money for other people has. So stepping down as the CEO, but maintaining your general partner standing or maintaining your fiduciary responsibility for your existing companies, which, I don't know, number in the thousands, maybe 1,500, 2,000, I can't remember the exact number. It's really just like a slap on the wrist. Now, finally, what ends up happening is either he resigns or they have more difficult uh, conversations internally, but, you know, frankly, he kind of gets taken out of that business. But to be fair, again, TechCrunch writes an article that they called Employee Email Claims That the 500 Startup Leadership 
knew about this and that new allegations are coming out. And I think this is pretty really straightforward, right? That as soon as Cheryl wrote her thing, Cheryl, as I said before, very well respected, not just in her own country, not just regionally, but globally in her space. You know, once people start doing this, that it's like a it's like a waterfall of people coming out and then saying, geez, if I had known mm. that there were so many other people to which this was happening, I would have come out earlier. Okay. And I, I encourage anybody who hasn't read through Cheryl's um, piece, it's long, but it's definitely worth reading. And I think everybody who has a relationship with the tech startup space um, should know about this. Now, we like to talk about, so again, it's, this is called um, Shedding Light, right? Shedding Light on the Black Box of Inappropriateness. And we should, I don't even know why she calls it a black box, but I'm willing to put up with any type of uh, terminology that she has here. It also looks to me, although I can't tell who the other guy in that picture, the other guys in that picture is, um, you know, there are other men in this business at senior levels, right? Not just in the United States, but globally. And there's no way that they didn't know. Mm. There's just no way. I don't want to use the word culpable necessarily, but, you know, <laughs> we, we used to we used to go to bars in Roppongi back in the early to mid '90s. You won't believe it, but you know we saw some pretty bad behavior in there. And we used to stand in between people that were trying to abuse girls and those people, and just try to stop it from happening. And we've disintermediated yeah. a bunch of stuff over time. I mean, I know it doesn't sound like the truth, but you know, go ask the guys that I used to hang out with. I can think of a particular time in a particular place. We just stood there and we're like, "What are you doing? Like, really, what are you doing?" Because you're not dealing with her anymore. You're dealing with like the four of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exactly a big guy and I was pretty sure I was going to get my ass kicked. But it didn't matter because that was protecting somebody else. The point is that like this is a company that is, has off-sites globally. You've seen the pictures of them post. You've seen the pictures posted of them. These are big off-site parties where they talk about global strategy. Now, I can only begin to imagine what these off-sites were, were like. Okay. And again, you have men and women drinking in a place – Fair enough, right? I mean, I've been to events at Echelon where, um, in Singapore, where the after party kind of gets a little bit out of hand. You right. just stand in there watching, saying, because, you know, again, these after parties are held in a bar, which I always thought was insane. And you're standing around, they're serving, it's like all you can drink wine and beer for two hours. I don't know how long it is, I don't remember. And you just stand there going, this is not like a regular bar. Yeah, it feels yeah. like it is, which is, makes it a really, excuse my language, but it feels like it, feels like it is so it's a shitty place to have a, 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 a post-event party. But what it does is it kind of tricks your brain into thinking exactly. the women in this room are just women at a bar. We're you think it's guys. safe? We have nothing yeah. to do. Yeah, it feels like a safe thing. So I'm just going to go over yeah. and act like it's an unknown person when in reality either that person works with you, works for you, you work for them or whatever. And I've been there going, oh, i got to get out of here because… These are dangerous situations. A lot of people are there… And they haven't eaten anything all day as well, right? And they're kind yeah. of letting go. They're letting off a bit of steam. It's a real cocktail for, well, bad behavior. <laughs> it's just, it's such a toxic environment. Right. Okay. And again, you know, we're talking about tech. So we'll put it in the context of like techs and startup yeah, yeah, companies yeah. and venture capitalism. But the reality is that like you have a bunch of people at a post-event um, party for any industry. It could be like a real estate party and the same type of stuff is going to happen. But again... It's not a problem if it's too – and here's the key, right? None of this is a problem if it's consensual. Yeah. I really don't think so. So you, you talked about this earlier, right? Like if, if someone is working for – not me, but let's just say for me, right? And sitting on a whatever in a place and I say, you know, hey, let's have dinner. And they say, sure, I'd love to. And if nothing bad ever happens as a result of that, nobody loses their job, nobody gets an extra promotion, you know, it's just, it's just a nice thing. You end up like having a great lifelong relationship. You have kids together. Everybody's happy. There's no problem with that, actually. And I think if you go and look at statistics, a lot of people will say that they've met their partner yeah, yeah, exactly. at, their, at their job. But what if that, that woman was to turn around and say, you know, he asked me for dinner. I went to dinner only because, you know, my promotion was riding on it. You know, if that relationship sours, then this is the kind of, this is sort of the gray area, isn't it? Because I guess what people are trying to work out is what is the, what is the line in the sand, right? Should, should you just sort of say, I mean, we're seeing a lot of like these decency clauses and stuff like that being introduced into companies now, right? 
you know, people are having guidelines laid out for them. I think people need something to understand, right? Because, you know, that, that situation you talk about in the bar, how do people behave? Because you get a lot of young people go into that situation. People don't want to go in there and end up causing, you know, a real ruckus because they got drunk and said something to somebody, you know, which was maybe said in an innocent fashion, right? So I guess people... yeah. You know, could be. there's going to be a kickback from this whole saga, right? And that's going to get people scared, isn't it? So I, I don't know. I mean, I can imagine people want to know. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't have any sort of knock on for me because I rarely go to those situations. <laughs> I stay away from them, right? And I'm exactly. You know, it's kind of like I, I know where things can go wrong, right? So I stay away. You just kind of avoid these situations, right? Yeah. I mean, again, but if you're forced to had, be in a situation, yeah, if you're forced to be in a situation, okay, like just be on your best behavior, right? right? With I mean, drink involved, you know, you empty stomach drink. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, have a little bit of self control, like be an adult. You know, I, I look at the pledges for decency and stuff like that. I think anybody that has to sign a decency <laughs> pledge is not a decent person to begin with, right? You know what's right and wrong. And you know what's right and wrong in almost all situations. If I asked you, here's the thing. If you're a guy in a room with another guy, you're in a, or in a lady in a room with another lady, and one of those people starts misbehaving, and your friend goes, dude, really? Yeah. Not here. You mo in most cases, you'd be like, oh, shit, you're right. That is wrong. Right. Right? So if there were other people in the room at, like, Cheryl's apartment, and if they notice, like, you you've done this, too. You go like this. Bill, look, we got to get out of here. Yeah, right. Because this is not going to end well, and tomorrow you're going to wish. But he, he's the boss. It. Maybe you can't say that's that. That's the right? point, though. Right. But that's the whole problem. That's the whole problem with this is you're the boss. Right. Okay? And this goes both ways, right? Like, there are potentially, and I say potentially, right, there are potentially, you know, women that are in positions of power that could, that could do the same thing and probably yeah. have. But statistically... It's a male problem because there are more men in charge than there are women. So, like, it just gets back to the core of this whole issue, right? But as you said, there need there do need to be rules around this. But, like, the reality is, mm. and, you know, who was it? Somebody was once talking about, you know, somebody swearing. It was a comedian. I don't know if it was George Carlin or not. But he was like, he was like, do you, like, somebody was swearing and talking with a really dirty mouth. And he was like, do you eat with that mouth? Do you kiss your <laughs> mother with that mouth? Like, Really? That's the way you're behaving. And I think that's kind of, that's part of my view on this is like, you have cousins, right? Mm. You have a sister. You have a mother. You definitely have a mother if you've been born. You have a grandmother. Is this the type of behavior you want them, you want to be perpetrated on them? Because if you think that's okay, you've got a much larger problem. And that's more than like just being a creep. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. I think. And an apology is not going to make it good, is it? No, because it's just like, you know, 25 years later, later apologizing to somebody for, you know, <laughs> for beating them up every day. Look, I'm really sorry. Yeah, but yeah, now yeah. every time you see somebody raise their hand, you get nervous that they're going to hit you because this has been happening to you for the past 25 years. Yeah. Right. And I don't want this to be one of those things where like there's a big fear made about this. And then like two weeks later, everybody forgets about it and goes back to work. Okay, because it's just the wrong it's just the wrong way to behave. I think most people, if you are smart enough and you're educated enough and you're motivated enough to be in this industry and in this environment, you know what's right and wrong. Don't so do the wrong what, thing. What good is going to come out of this? I mean, let's try and find the positive. I mean, there was definitely good in the fact that a whole bunch of women came forward and they probably kept their stories to themselves or maybe you know within their closed circles for years right so that's good that that's out right so those women have now got a voice and they're not sort of stifled by you know the culture of the organizations they work in but long term what good will come out of this well i mean hopefully here's the thing too right is that there's a there's a macho culture around you know i you know i saw dave do that thing but i can't say anything to him you know right i just can't do that he's part of my tribe yeah. I can't do that. But the reality is, I think that, you know, and again, for lack of a better term, like a real man would stand up and say something. And when you, sh when you shine a light on, on bad behavior, you mm -hmm. just want to make sure that that light's there forever. Now, you're right. The pendulum has the potential to swing way in the other direction. 
It's like, when is it not okay at work? And I've seen this happen, right? I saw this happen a lot. When is it not, like, if you walk into a, if you walk into a building, right, and you're my colleague, and I go, geez, that's a great tie. Where did you get that tie? Right. And you're like, oh, man, I was in New York over the weekend, and I got this new Xenia thing because it came out with a new collection. That's okay. And no one's going to complain about it. Right, so when is it okay to say so? And and, I, and again, people yell at me for saying this, but when is it okay to go? That's you know, you bought a new dress, right? Hmm. When is it okay? You're just innocent for me to go. That's really pretty, and it really favors you. It flatters you. Right. Like there's a part. There's a part. Is that harassment? I mean, if you were the boss, would that be harassment? I don't think so. I think you have to be careful. But I think right. that that's okay. I can give you a compliment, right? Because I can go like this. Did you get your haircut? Yeah. I think it. I think it really flatters you. Right, but what I can't do is say that haircut and that new dress, and you look really great. But please, just tonight, just one time. Yeah. Right, because that's the difference, right? That's the difference, and there can't be caveats. If if you let me do this or get away with this behavior, then you can have the benefits of some other behavior. And if it feels like there's a quid pro quo, it's mm-hmm. wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just wrong. I think that's the problem, isn't it? That there's sort of there's a lot of trivial stuff around this whole area, which kind of, I think, distracts from the bigger picture, right? You know, I mean, like for example, walking into the office and saying "Hello, ladies," you know, that could be classified by some organisations as being harassment. That's the kind of trivialization of the whole matter, I think. You know, there are some really important issues and some really bad behaviour going on. We need to deal with those. And not let that sort of trivial stuff become the discussion point, right? Because then people say, oh, well, you know, does that mean I can't do this now or I can't do that? Which is fine. But I think, you know, that kind of takes away from what we're really trying to do here is to root out the, I don't know if the sickness is the right word, but... But it could be. Exactly. The culture of that whole sort of macho culture, which, you know... It's not just VC world, is it? I mean, you've worked in investment no, it's banking. Everywhere. Investment banking yeah, it's, is the the big swinging <laughs> dick, so to speak. We go back to Wall Street, <laughs> <laughs> but it it is what it is, right? But but I mean, we used to say to each other, like, dude, seriously, and, and again, excuse my language, but like, if that's the only way you can get laid, that's a problem. Yeah, it's you know, I don't want to talk in those terms, but like, that that's a problem, and that gets back to what I talked about before, right? Like. If the only reason why you have interest is because of proximity, that's a bad thing. You got to be able to separate like church and state. You know what I mean? Like just separate them. Mm. And there's enough opportunity, you know, in the world and in other places that you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, don't 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 shit where you eat is what we used to say at work, right? Yeah. It comes back. Um, it comes back to haunt you. It does every single time. It never ends well. But here's the other thing, too, is that there were so many times at work where someone would come over to you and say, like, I just want you to know, like, no one knows this, but I'm having a relationship with Tommy or whatever. Yeah. And you just go like this. Everybody knows. Yeah. No, seriously, everybody knows. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, there's so, it's so hard to keep a secret, particularly when there are humans involved. Yeah. Um, and particularly if that secret started like at a Christmas party or at a holiday party or at someone's, you know, summer barbecue, like you said, where there's alcohol there. Um, the whole idea is, you know, again, if you're going to go, just like don't, don't, don't shit where you eat because it just ends up being problematic later. Like nobody ever comes out of it okay. Mm-hmm. Ever. I see it so many times. There are plenty of people who have gotten themselves into so much trouble for things that later on just ended up being so trivial. And you knew it when you were doing at it. You know, you knew it when you were doing it. Like for the five minutes of pleasure or enjoyment, it's just not worth it. Mm-hmm. Just this one time, it's just not good enough for me. And, and you know, again, if you're a 25 year old and like no one's taught you, and you've had bad sort of mentorship from your mom or your dad or your family, whatever, I would even say fair enough. Use it as something to learn from. Mm. I mean, you're 51 years old. Yeah, I just find it problematic. And remember, it's not about it's not about being like a womanizer. You know, you can you can say whatever you want about that, right? And we can argue about this until we're blue in the face. Like, if you're a single dude or a married guy, you got a girlfriend, like, that's your problem. And as long as it's consensual, you ask somebody out and they say yes. Right. I'm not making a value judgment on that. All I'm saying is if you ask somebody out and they say no, yeah. hey, guess what? It's a no. Well, that, that's good to hear, though, isn't it? Because I think that's what people worry is that, 
you're going to try and regulate out that kind of behavior in the, I'm not talking about being predatory, but being a womanizer, for example, because, you know, whether or not you think it's a good thing or not, it's not necessarily a predatory thing, right? In the no. wild. I mean, outside of the office, fine. If you want to behave like that, if you want to hit on every single woman, that's fine. But, you know, you're not forcing yourself upon them, right? No, I mean, look, there are plenty of men and women, right, who do the same thing. So just walk up. Hey, what are you doing tonight? Okay, no, fine. Next. Hey, what are you doing? It's numbers guy. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Perfect. Whatever, right? And, and that, like, is it good or bad? And again, I'm not going to make a value judgment. But, yeah. but societally, that's okay. But what's not okay is it's dark in here. We're alone. I know you didn't expect that, and I'm going to push you up against the wall. So here's the thing. We talked about this when we talked about the female entrepreneurs back in 21 and 22. One of the things I said, and I, I guess, you know, we don't get is we'll never see it from their side. You know, because if I hear this, I mean, if, if a man said this kind of thing, my sort of initial macho reaction is just harden the frick up, right? You know, just, <laughs> yeah, just, just well, man suck. up. That's what yeah, we say. Man up, man up. It just man suck up. up, you know, like, didn't you learn anything in the, the schoolyard? That's the sort of the very macho default response that I've been indoctrinated with, right? And, you know, I, I will never know what it feels like to be on the other side of that as a woman, right? So it's kind yeah. of hard for me. It's difficult to empathize, but I guess that's the purpose of talking this through, isn't it? You kind of it is. having to put yourself in their shoes because I can't see this as a man would see it because it is different, right? Yeah, I cannot see it as a woman would see it at all because like you said, but I have to... So what I have to do is I have to rely on their leadership and what they say is the right way to behave, right? But again, remember this. Let's go back to the bar example. If you and I are standing in a bar and you do something I don't like and I, I punch you out, you might even get up and go, wow, that's a tough guy. You're on my team now. Right. Like, wow, I didn't expect that from you. I underestimated you. You're a lot cooler than I thought. But if you do that to like some lady, you know, metaphorically, and she fights back, you know, the commentary, I don't even have to go there. I don't want to go there. But the commentary is not the same way. The commentary is not, wow, that's, that's, a, tough, that's a tough cookie. Let's get that person on our team. It's like, oh, for, it's like, for gosh sake, you know, you know where that's going. And that's not a good conversation. You're right. You don't know what that feels like. Yeah. And we don't know. I don't know what it feels like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, but I'm comfortable with the fact that I don't know what it feels like. And I'll tell you what. He doesn't know what it feels like either, and this gets back to the this gets back to the beginning of this conversation. I'll tell you what, it's not a big surprise if you walk around like you're a big swinging dick all the time, and you use that as part of your like culture. We're talking about this a lot, right, in other yeah. contexts, but yeah. that's the culture you you build. It's going to come back and bite you in the ass, and that's exactly what this did. And like I said, I'm not I'm not surprised, mm -hmm. not a big surprise. And again, I think this is a you know, this, this behavior is like constant. Yeah. Do you think it's right. rife? I mean, do you think this is just the tip of the iceberg or I know, I mean, that's, that's a really hard question to ask and it's tough to generalize, but do you, do you think there's a lot more of these or this is an isolated incident? I think it's everywhere at all times. I really do. I think it's so much more prevalent than anyone's ever willing to talk about it. For every 12 women that come out and say, this happened to me, there's 1200 women who haven't come out and said it because they're just too scared. Yeah. Because because again, if you come out when everybody else comes out and says it and you're part of that like initial wave of people who feel like you're a hero and you're you know, you're part of this thing and then two years later you're alone again. Yeah, right. And that's the problem, is that at some point you've got to tell like either we've got to make a decision, you know what, that's okay. Screw you, like that's okay behavior, which it's not. Or just go, This is completely unacceptable behavior and when you see it and again, sure. You're going to make mistakes sometimes, right? But when you see it, you stop it. Hmm. There's got to be a way to make it better. I'm just, I'm an optimist in most cases. There's just got to be a way to make this better. Okay, yeah. and I'll rely, and I don't necessarily think it's a decency pledge written up by men for other men to sign. No. Like, I just don't think that's the way it works. No. That's trivializing it. There's a lot more to it, isn't there? I mean, it's, it's fundamental. Look at the numbers. We talked about this in our, one of the previous episodes. So was it 97% of all venture capital funding goes to male found, founders? You know, something like 58. There's a number here. I wish I had it. Yeah, so most venture capitalists, this comes from the article in the New York Times, right? Women in tech speak frankly on culture of harassment. Down in the middle, it says, most venture capitalists and entrepreneurs are men, with female entrepreneurs receiving $1.5 billion in funding last year. 
and $58.2 billion for men. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I think you can generalize about who's really in charge of any particular company, male or female, but even if it's even if the women's funding is double or triple that, it's still 10 times higher yeah. for men. I, it's just it's on balance for sure. And remember, you have two guys sitting in a room discussing whether they sh whether one of them should be funded by the other guy. It's very different than a woman being in a room asking another man for money. Mm -hmm. It's just really different. And you see this in a lot of situations, right? Again, it's not just in the VC world, but... You see it in a lot of situations. And to be fair, when I was at Morgan Stanley back in the early 90s, like one of the best, if not the best and most successful fixed income salespeople was a lady. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was awesome. And she was a tough cookie. And she must have. Yards. I was going to say, wow, to survive that. But particularly in that, and particularly in that office, you know, that's what, 27 years ago or 25 yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah. That, that was a um, tough macho culture as well. Super. Yeah, was it the was it the Boiler Room movie where they used to say? No, 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 no. This was Morgan Stanley. This was like the bluest of the blue blood. This yeah. was like a very sophisticated, very kind of well-behaved trading floor. But even in that context, yeah. um, for a woman like that to succeed, which she did do, and she did it very well, um, you had to have been impressed. I want to go back to one more thing because we talked about this earlier. Okay, and this is this is from the apology. You know, I'm a creep. I was stupid, or whatever it was called. Like I'd like to state clearly, and I'm reading that my past actions are most certainly my own fault and responsibility. Until recently, there's a very catch-all phrase. Recently means what? Yeah. This week, this month, yeah. this year, Until this I got decade. <laughs> but wait a second, though. You know, and I feel for Christine Tsai as well, senior management, right? But Christine and other senior management at 500 were unaware of my actions. Mm -hmm. I just say, look, I don't know. I don't have... I don't have the 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 facts or the details, and I've I've got no um I've got no evidence. But really, like really, it goes deep though, doesn't it? I mean, there's so many issues that this pulls apart on on us. It's a very complicated twine of different threads, isn't it? You know, it's not just about female entrepreneurs, but it's the whole culture as well. You know, and that the female entrepreneurs really are at the sort of the unfortunately the receiving end of the worst part of that culture within startups. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So it's good yeah. it's gonna be some healthy debate. I hopefully you know, hopefully that this will be a change for the good and outing people who well, I guess are predators or negative influences within that industry will be good for everybody in the long run, right? Yeah, I mean, I want to get to a point where this type of behavior actually is a shocking surprise. Yeah, right. Where people are like, oh, my God. I mean, I, I'll put you this way. A lot of people have contacted me with things like, surprised? Not really. Yeah. Okay, so this is not just me. This is me, like, as a voice for other people who have voiced their opinions to me, and most of them are like, yeah, not a big surprise. Mm. So I don't think it's just you and me that are that are having this view on this. I think there's a lot of quiet going on right now. People just shaking their heads in the dark somewhere. And if we can give them a voice, that's fine. And if I take some flack for this, so be it. But I just think at some point you got to stand up and be counted on this. And um, and I'm happy to do it. So yeah, well, it's good though. We aired it. Um, this is a good sort of uh, follow on from the the episodes we did about the female entrepreneurs, right? Twenty one and twenty two. Yeah. Worth yeah. going back and checking those out because, you know, it's not just about sharing their stories, but also understanding what they have to go through as well. I'm not saying they've yeah. gone through something like this, but it's that whole culture, isn't it? So, Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully we'll get some feedback from them and hopefully, you know, they'll give us more information, whether yeah. it's um, directly from somebody or if it's anonymous, I'm happy to hear it. And, and I'm, you know, we say this all the time, but like, I have an opinion, but I don't have a monopoly on the right opinion. And... You know, I want to be, I think I was listening to a podcast today with Reed Hoffman and he was like, you know, you need to be a lifetime learner. Yeah. And it, that may be a catchphrase too, but I really believe that. Like you're only, you're only becoming a better person every day if you just, if you're open to learning new things and those new things can be about you. So, you know, tell me I'm wrong, but tell me, tell me why. Um, and I'm happy to learn. But I think that what happened here is not a big surprise to people. And I want to get to a point where it is a gigantic surprise where, Men in power are not being sexual predators, sexually harassing, um, <clears throat> you know, or or just you know being using sexual power over women. I just don't want to see this anymore. I want that to be a shock. 
and it's a better world for us guys as well at the end of the day you know yeah frankly it makes our lives a lot easier too exactly right because you know i don't want to get looped in i don't want to get grouped into the same thing but if there are the men out there that are sexually assaulting people on a regular basis and those are my words i'm reading from cheryl's stuff right my personal account of sexual assault from dave you know, i didn't tell her what to say she decided on her own hmm. um and i'm sure she's and i'm sure she thought a lot about this right but anyway, I think maybe we should end there. I think we've spent enough time talking about it. But I just want to make sure that we're shining a light in the right places. We certainly um, are. It was, a, it was a tough subject to cover this week, but I think worth getting it out there and airing it. If people have opinions, feedback, comments, Facebook, Twitter. Let's run through the, the links for everybody, Michael. Yeah, so you can, you can you know, DM me on Twitter at Michael Waits. Um, or at Asia Tech Pod, hashtag it Asia Tech Podcast to us. Yep. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. You can email me at michael.waits at gmail.com. Contact me anywhere you want. We have a Facebook page, and we're all over Twitter as well. So just let us know. We're happy sure. to have feedback. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget the Facebook page. Join us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Asia Tech Podcast. We will be here every Tuesday evening, Asia time, taking live Q&A. Join us for the live session. We'll see you there. Thank you, Graham.